Each week, elementary school students would gather around a radio at school, eager to hear selections of the Entei's so-called radio programmi scolastici, or educational radio programs. The Royal Radio Corporation, um, through the Royal Radio Corporation, the regime connected peripheral places such as Seaside Sabaudia, Seaside Sabaudia, perhaps the most attractive of the so-called In Vigliati's colorful travel poster here, Visitate Sabaudia, the architectural figure notably appears erect, positioned to echo the solid modern architectural towers of the city's church, Casa del Fascio, and post office. And yet it also alludes to Sabaudia's architecture and the trademark skyline of a medieval town like San Gimignano. Moreover, Sabaudia emerges a resort with its own beach, lake, mountains, and forests, so that fascists, so that even the uh, tree trunks you can see right here look like little fasci. Indeed, the habit of turning any vertical element, whether a tree trunk, a building, a column, or even the letter T, into a fascase became a rampant tendency amongst not only architects but also graphic designers. A precursor to what today we might call in English distance or online learning, the Ente Radio Rurales transmission served as the first mass media exposure to key current and past events, as well as information about the cultural and natural landscape of diverse regions of Italy and the colonies for many Italians, and especially Italian children. In addition to designing and transmitting radio programs, beginning in 1934, the Ente published the monthly bulletin titled Radio Rurale, whose initial print run of 130,000 was sent to various party leaders and officials, religious figures, and most importantly, elementary school teachers stationed throughout the periphery in order to encourage them not only to tune in, but also to convince their schools to purchase these discounted radio sets through the extensive state subsidies and bursaries available. A predecessor to the posters that are the, that are the central subject of my lecture, the monthly bulletin itself is of significant interest. Designed to support teachers' incorporation of radio into their lesson plans in various ways, each issue of the magazine contained a full schedule of the upcoming month's transmissions, primarily on school days, but also with reruns and more family-oriented programs on Sundays and holidays. Typical topics covered included famous cultural and artistic figures that were considered Italian, such as Christopher Columbus or Michelangelo, politicians such as Garibaldi or King Umberto, popular fairy tales, lyrics of political and festive songs, and special historical events. From the outset, the Radio Rurale magazine included travel spots that delivered the sounds of special destinations to listeners, exposing them to church bells, marketplaces, and local cultural festivals, while presenting spots about new towns or other regions. The magazine also included small black and white photos linked to the schedules and synopses, as well as listings for contests, such as this one, to submit a drawing um, and lyrics to songs. So what you see here is a sort of, I don't know what you call it in Spanish, connect the dots. And the idea was that children would create whatever pictures they wanted to, mail them in, and then you would hear it announced on the radio, and that child would be invited to Rome to be interviewed, and there was significant enthusiasm. And the next magazine might even publish that story about that child. So there was sort of a following. Interwoven with all of this, of course, were special articles and reports on Mussolini's trips to various communities, replete with photos glorifying his working the fields, appearing in schools, and more. Articles also announced and summarized competitions for teachers to design new programs to be featured on the radio. Finally, each issue would often present various statistics mapping out the increasing numbers of schools that had invested in radio sets. On, in the October 25, 1936 issue of Radio Urorale, the Ente proudly announced that it would produce, quote unquote, not fewer than 30 large scale color cartelli, or posters, connected with school programs projected for transmission throughout the 1936-1937 year. One copy of each poster would be sent to each of those institutional subscribers who had purchased radios through the Ente's state subsidized program. The following year, there were fewer than had been promised in the ad, but the ad that said the series would continue was a little bit more exciting and more visual. And then here you can see an actual envelope with the creases that explain 
with the size of which explains the creases and most of the surviving examples that have been sent out and folded up and that sort of thing. Okay, so the announcement also explained that requests for, the, for additional copies of the full po series of posters could be requested on an ad hoc basis for 15 lire or prorated prices for partial sets. All in all, the Ente produced about 40 posters, many of which were connected to programs that were rebroadcast repeatedly, thus extending the value of the posters to be conserved for future reference. And here you can see a couple of them up on the back of a wall in, a, in, a, in an aula a classroom. Okay. A relatively unknown figure who worked in graphic arts as well as a journalist in radio, film, and eventually post-war television production, Oreste Gasparini is credited um, by some scholars with the more than 40 or so posters, all of which measure 70 by 100 centimeters, designed to be visual counterparts to enhance the programs on a given month's schedule. And here you can see it's a similar layout. Um, this is just a double spread in the magazine. Much like other mural newspapers, which were popular not only in Italy, but other Mediterranean countries at the time, these arresting half-tone images comprised black and white photographs, maps, cartoons, historical documents, paintings, and editorial comments set in modern fonts against bright, colorful backgrounds. Like the programs themselves, they too addressed a wide range of topics, ancient Roman and more modern Italian history strategies of war and military technology here in the context, well, sorry, this is um, about the Risorgimento or the reunification, here the First World War, regionalism and specific sites, um, the colonial expansion in North and East Africa, natural phenomena such as undersea wildlife, and even mass media itself with representations of newspapers. Um, and as we'll also see, things like the ONB Academia Fascista Femminile di Orvieto and the Regia Academia di Livorno. Replete with compelling and often exoticizing, Im exoticizing images accompanied by lively explicative captions, the posters open up windows onto unknown places, experiences, and historical events, expanding the cultural and geographical panoramas of their viewers and listeners. While the radio programs in place already delivered a diverse menu of cultural tourism and general military know-how to school children, these posters added a new layer, bringing the material broadcast alive in the imaginations of the listener viewers. In some cases, posters served as propaganda to advertise specific politically charged exhibitions the infamous 1932 Mostra della Rivoluzione Fascista, or as we'll see in a minute, the 1937 Mostra Augustea, creating virtual visits for those who might never have the chance to see actual installations, thereby extending both the afterlife and influence of such spectacular events. Some posters explicitly explored Bonifica itself, the raison d'etre for the peripheral communities for which they were published and for which the radio programs existed. Here you can see some kids and drawings that from children's notebooks about the radio and some of their other, the things it promoted. Worth mentioning are the highly successful contemporary architectural periodicals of the 1930s, such as Quadrante, Prospettive, and Casabella, since these posters echoed the rich language of photomontage, which, like the architectural, actual architectural fabric of Italian fascist cities, pit modernity against antiquity and nationalism against regionalism. In this sense, the posters themselves echoed tensions at the core of negotiating Italian identity during the fascist era. And yet, although highly provocative in terms of both material content and sociological impact, the posters have been largely glossed over, only rarely appearing as fanciful examples of Italian interwar propaganda in more general exhibitions and catalogs. So in other words, you do see these posters come up in exhibition catalogs that deal with interwar propaganda, but no one ever really deals with what they did or what the, concept, the context was. Ultimately, I think that these cartelli occupy a liminal space that's between art and architecture. Moreover given, moreover, given their direct connection to radio programs, they constitute notable instances of visual representations of fascist urbanism and imperialism available to Italians living in the periphery. 
a new kind of urban simulacrum, they drew Italians' attention to mural surfaces in general, whose importance under fascism cannot be overstated. In that sense, I'm building on earlier studies that consider decorative facades and temporarily installed murals, such as Romy Golan's Mural Nomad, and more recent essay for the Italian Futurism show at the Guggenheim in 2014. And in that sense, I consider this to be a more ephemeral and arguably more dynamic category of mural decoration. Given that these posters incorporated indices of other times and other places, that is to say, past and present, near and far, these static yet mobile and portable images functioned as propaganda in a new way. Combining the nascent and contemporary languages of photomontage and cinema, they, in that sense, are palimpsests that gesture toward a third temporality, which, of course, is the future of the masses. And so each week, these installments via radio and words, and each month with a poster or images, would transform a 70 by 100 centimeter space into a portal onto another world, a world that enabled the newly founded sites lacking long histories to instantly inscribe themselves into the larger collective. Thus, new towns could more easily gloss over their own historical tabulae razae by absorbing external events into their own cultural imaginary and memory. Radio, already an integral part of this construction of fascist nationalistic propaganda, was made more tangible. And so the Ente Radio Rurale amplified its classroom presence by offering supplemental posters in the late 30s, turning the audio experience into a multimedia show and tell. Children's notebooks from the period feature colored pencil drawings of their responses to the lessons, representations of the radio itself, victory wishes from Hitler and Mussolini, radio's power to reach the farthest corners of the earth, emanating, of course, from Italy, and even one girl's fantasy of giving birth to a small pack of young fascist soldiers. A complete analysis of all of the poster images in the series exceeds the limit of my talk today. But I would like to instead to look at a sample to see how these radio programs and visual propaganda supporting them extended the shelf life of events along with, um, and along with expanding the reach of the regime deep into otherwise disconnected areas of the country. With titles ranging from the colonial wars, the reunification, the creation of a medieval knight, the great war, the fascist empire, and more, they presented exhibitions, colonialism, history, education, war, tourism, and mass media in short, manageable lessons. The Fascist Revolution, Supplement Number 14, the poster published in conjunction with the March 22, 1938 broadcast, focused on key aspects of the supposed fascist revolution. Read from left to right, it features photographs of sites and events ranging from Mussolini's office, from his days as an editor at Il Popolo d'Italia, and even a copy of that newspaper here. The corpses of fascist martyrs, the famous strike of August 1922, which found the fascists symbolically sweeping the streets, as well as photos of actual components of the Mostra della Rivoluzione Fascista, the 1932 exhibition dedicated to the 10th anniversary of the fascist march in Rome, mounted at the Palazzo delle Esposizioni on the Via Nazionale in Rome. And so that's the famous building there, where it was originally housed. And I'll talk about when it was remounted here at later. Okay. Um, so that was the, I just showed you the facade, the original facade of the exhibition that was remounted six years later um, at the Galleria Nazionale d'Arte Moderna. Much like the exhibition itself, the radio transmission with poster was a multimedia experience that through sound and image together connected otherwise peripheral areas of the nation to the show. Moreover, analogous to the Mostra's first installation, open for two full years, chronologically arranged A to Z galleries, in, chronologically arranged in A to C galler, Z galleries, the poster then breaks down the so-called revolution into pictorial compartments or vis virtual rooms to offer the viewer newspapers, flags, shirts, and photographs as souvenirs. Consider, for example, the inclusion of Giuseppe Terragna's, the Terragni's Sala O, here featured in the upper right-hand corner of the image, complete with its symbolic raised hands configured as a squadra d'azione, a counterbalance to the tra diagonal trajectory at work in the left side of the image. 
itself a frenetic example of photomontage, Sala O self-reflexively refers to the poster on which it appears, linking that renowned installation to this less grand and more accessible surrogate. Images of memorials to fallen martyrs, such as Giovanni Berta, a fallen Florentine fascist, appear as well. Key to running the modern fascist city properly were the railway and tram workers who appear in their own compartments as signifiers of efficiency, speed, and interconnectivity. The poster also includes an image of Carlo Bazzini's more solemn as well as more recent temporary facade, and that is right here, created for the second installation of the Mostro, which was expanded to include material on the colonial campaigns and remounted at the Galleria Nazionale in 1937. Okay, so that was the original one. Indeed, the transfer and reopening of the actual Mostra de della Rivoluzione Fascista was coordinated to coincide with the inauguration of a second show, the Mostra Augustea della Romanità, which opened on September 23, 1937, to mark the bimillennial anniversary of the first Roman emperor's birth. So that's the new facade of that same building on the bottom left, and that's a little bit closer um, image of that. Okay. As illustrated by supplement number 15, a program aired on April 20th, 1938, the, the Ente created a program dedicated to the above mentioned Mostra Augustea, split into upper and lower registered, focused on the past and the present. The, pro, the poster projects an image of antiquity through a self consciously focused fascist lens produced 2,000 years later, the exhibition. Moving from left to right across the very bottom horizontal register of the poster, we find images that provide the viewer with a tour of the exhibition space from an initial, I can't see if my, there, right here, sorry. From an initial exterior shot of the exhibition halls to the far left to three subsequent galleries, one, two, and, and three. At the bottom left is Aldo Scalpelli's temporary stripped down classical faux stone facade for the Palazzo delle Esposizioni, significantly more classical than Virenzi and Libera's project for the same building five years earlier. Modeled after ancient triumphal arches, the facade was decorated with excerpts of classical texts by Livy, Cicero, Pliny, and Augustine, all translated into vernacular Italian and embossed on its skin. Perched above the column-like piers, stand four Caesars who watch over spectators entering the exhibition arch below. Whereas the Mostra della Rivoluzione Fascista underscored fantastic graphics in presenting the 10th anniversary of the mythical birth of the regime in 1922, five years later, the Mostra Augustea invoked more documentary evidence in order to underscore the regime's historical origins. And so moving from left to right in that lowest register, we find a virtual walkthrough of part of the exhibition that is rationalized chronologically following Scalpelli's facade and the three specific rooms that are dedicated to ancient Rome, um, in imperial Rome, and Christian Rome, respectively. At the right of the image is a shot of the Augustus Prima Porta sculpture whose raised hand directs us to review a series of Roman achievements pointing to the map. <laughs> um, Augustus sutures together the monument to his cultural contributions below with the accomplishments to which he draws our attention, that is, the compartments filled with architectural models that are reconstructions of structures and sites in Italy and Africa, including a patrician villa from Pompeii, Hadrian's villa at Tivoli, the theater at Sabratha, the Colosseum, and a Roman bridge in Spain. In short, architectural treasures near and far across the Mediterranean Empire populated the images. Italo Gismondi's plaster model of Rome in the fourth century, begun in 1935 for the Museo della Civiltà Romana in the Aeor district of Rome, looms above as yet another fascist configuration of the ancient world, this time hailing from late antiquity. So this is that famous model towards the top on the right that you often see posters of being sold today outside of the Colosseum. That comes from that fascist model that you can still visit, although it is very um, covered in dust. It's kind of, <laughs> it's awful. Okay. All right. Many posters sought to educate youngsters about military technology, strategies, and training, including land, sea, and even air battle techniques and equipment. 
Here, for example, we find land and sea, supplement number 10, connected to a transmission on February 19, 1937, that illustrates the Royal Naval Academy in Livorno, while supplement number 13, connected to a transmission on March 18, 1938, shifts its emphasis from the place of education to the profession that space offered in explaining how to become a sailor. And one thing you'll notice is they reuse the same pictures in some cases. They were a little bit lazy. So you see them come up and kind of manipulate it in different ways. Okay. To the profession that space offered in explaining, quote, how to become a sailor. The Royal Academy image includes a bird's eye view of the Naval Academy complex, hence providing the listener with an unusual view of this modern construction project. In comparing the two images, we find that the topics overlap and, as I showed you, the images also. The designer frequently repeated certain images in different posters, including shots of rooms with the underwater um, torpedoes that we just saw, classroom spaces, and athletic halls. We also often see identical images of smiling young sailors and specific boats. So was this a way of saving money, or was it a way of sort of visually repeating um, certain images, which is sort of unclear? The Ente campaign included programs that were part of a larger effort to illustrate potential future professions. For youngsters, supplement number 12, connected to a broadcast on March 9, 1938, explores the path ahead of young men and young women interested in becoming physical education teachers. One of the most elegant posters in the series, this image has several black and white images of carefully choreographed groups engaged in physical exercises such as gymnastics, fencing, marching, skiing, and dance, as well as the marching and musical activities that often accompanied important sporting events, all cast against a bright yellow background. While the majority of the images of moving bodies are not contextualized, with the exception of the Women's Academy at Orvieto, the design does suggest a kind of institutional framework for the exercises performed. In fact, more than any other poster in the series, the composition echoes the strategies of repetition as well as organized masses seen in the nearly contemporary images of the 1936 Berlin Olympics games as recorded in Nazi German propaganda films, most familiar perhaps with Lady Riefenstahl's Olympia. While I'm not suggesting that Gasparini's series was necessarily directly in influenced by Riefenstahl, it does bear striking affinities with Nazi propaganda contemporary to its production. Several posters in the series shift their emphasis beyond physical fitness and training to more explicit references to war. In addition to emphasizing military themes on land and at sea, the Ente included many programs focused on terminology, equipment, and military strategies for the sky. Supplement 20, connected to transmissions on March 25th and 26th, 1937, mapped out a step-by-step -step plan for an infantry assault, while number 15, connected to transmissions on April 23rd and 24th, 1937, visualized a naval battle showing photos of submarines and battleships as well as maps of formation, battle formations and plans. Finally, Supplement 12, coordinated with the transmission on March 13, 1937, illustrated a bombed city, Una Città Bombardata. Drawing on futurist graphic design, the image shows circular compartments that mimic the movement of round dropping bombs as it shows the effetti di un bombardamento in three separate bouncing spheres to the bottom left of the image. Countering that action, battle planes dropping bombs from the upper right-hand corner show the action of chemical war warfare as well. What seems relevant is that the Ente transmissions, in addition, in addition to promoting fascist urbanism and imperialism on the ground, make a clear correlation between fascist Italy's control of the seas and the skies, as envisioned in images like Ernesto Tayat's painting Il Nocere of 1939 on the eve of the outbreak of war. What I'm arguing is that the program's emphasis on weapons was not only for military purposes, but also for the purpose of thematizing airborne propaganda writ large. In other words, the posters transmit a secondary, self-reflexive function in the sense that they emphasize their own medium, that is to say, wireless radio transmission, as a cultural weapon of the future. Thus, along with the military activity and its representation, vis-a-vis -vis the rich body of futurist Ero Pittura, which enabled bird's eye views of city and country, the Ente's posters underscore the power of airborne experience. Extending the nationalistic associations with air transmissions established by Gabriele D'Annunzio's legendary mission for dropping leaflets over Vienna at the end of World War I, 
Radio enabled a new kind of propagandistic reconnaissance project aimed at mobilizing airwaves rather than airspace. Parla il pilota is a poster that stages three diagonally set waves of photographs of aircrafts, including not only various military planes, but also a hot air balloon, a parachute, and even Leonardo da Vinci's drawings of a drawing of a flying machine. Set against the burning hot burning orange of a hot sun that sears the wings of an Art Deco Icarus, supplement number eight, linked to a program on February 5th, 1937, illustrates the benefits of flight as well as the aesthetic appeal of air travel from antiquity onwards, especially in the context of Italy's aggressive colonial expansion. Many of the posters were a bit more benign, um, and they, in more or less explicit ways, promoted virtual tourism to connect the peripheral populace to otherwise inaccessible and faraway places, as they were trying to kind of share a natural cultural heritage. And in this case, in promoting Sicily, the bi a binary structure, old and new, near and far, continues with a group of skiers doing snow sports in the country of snow sunshine. The program commemorates Mussolini's visit to Sicily in bolder and larger typescript than other captions, which include 4,000 years of history, which traverse the Greek temples of Selenunte, the age-old burning fury of volcanoes, and the serenity of medieval cloisters. Here, in this way, Sicily offers a quote-unquote splendor of monuments through local culture and industry, ranging from, quote, typical carriages to specialty foods. But with Mussolini's visit to Sicily, the image underscores crowds, the crowd assembled to welcome him, assembled much as children would cluster around the radios themselves. Supplement number 11, the poster dedicated to La Sardegna, linked to a program transmitted on March 5, 1938, exemplifies how the posters advertise new fascist urbanism amidst historical monuments. So nestled in between the crumbling Bronze Age Nurage and the sleek modern cityscape of Mussolini, which was renamed after the war. That's a little view of Mussolini. This monument to living civilization also includes a late medieval church in Campanile. As in the case of the poster for the Mostra Augustea, this installment traces a continuous chronological narrative in which past, present, and future are interdependent while also highlighting the geographical diversity of Sardinia through attractions such as Cagliari sul Mare and Sassari Luminoso, Luminosa with its Duomo along with other churches, bell towers, and local craftsmen. And finally, to the right, as I pointed out, um, and gesturing toward the future, or at least the fascist present, we find Mussolini, which was renamed Arboria in 1944, an area drained under the Bonifica program and officially dedicated on October 28, 1928, complete with two of its key fascist buildings, the local Casa del Fascio and the Casa del Balila, visualizing sites of local fascist government and youth culture alike. Mare Nostrum, supplement number six, linked to a program from January 26, 1938, imagines ancient Roman imperialism through the then contemporary fascist cinematic vision. In featuring film stills from Carmine Galone's Scipio Africano, the award-winning blockbuster released at the Venice Film Festival in 1937, the poster remaps the Mediterranean as a specifically Italian military imperative. Advertising a film that radio listeners might have hoped to see, um, the poster provides a glorified vision of ancient war in North Africa for Italians about to be shipped off to fight in that same locale. Literally putting cinema on the map, radio aligns itself with cinema as one of the latest modes of mass communication. Moreover, the poster illustrates the anatomy of an ancient warship, embedding that within the larger program for military lessons. Several of the Ante's programs focused on the unfolding events connected to Italian colonialism in North and East Africa. For example, the conquest of Libya, supplement number 10, um, connected to a program from March 1938, establishes 1911 as a precursor to fascist activity in Libya and portrays the local con population as content. Quote, Arabs of today, faithful soldiers of Italy. The posters repeatedly insist on the campaigns as land reclamation, as restoration of a former empire, and as a kind of return to origins. Local culture is described as, quote unquote, mysterious piazze, and beautiful landscape dotted with ruins of the Roman past, as here with the Libyan shore, which has been remapped according to the bonifica of the land and the people. 
Fascist hegemony greets the viewer in the form of the triumphal arch between Tripolitania and Cyrenaica. Moreover, the program features um, a modern, sorry, cement bridge, which is poised to bridge both geographical and cultural gaps along a colonial highway. Mussolini on horseback. Where am I? I think I should be on the next one. Yeah, here we are. Sorry. Mussolini on horseback brand dramatically brandishes the sword of Islam against a bird's eye view of Tripoli. Read from left to right, the composition culminates in a ceremonial return to ancient ruins. And we find not only cement bridges, but also fascist monuments and military exercises that emphasize the recuperation of ancient Roman remains. In closing, I'd like to look at a couple of posters that seem conscious of their own craft. Come nasce un giornale adds yet another dimension to the metaphorical mapping accomplished by the Ente posters. Numerous front pages of newspapers from all over the country and, um, sorry, Numerous front pages of newspapers are interwoven with photographs of the newspaper publication and distribution process itself, ranging from a local chronicler shouting out events to the transcription of newswires to the printing and eventual delivery via the striloni. Glancing quickly, we find the Corriere della Sera from Milan, the Balilla from Rome, Popolo d'Italia from Milan, La Stampa from Torino, Gazzetta del Popolo from Torino, Il Messaggero from Rome, Il Mattino from Naples, La Nazione from Florence, as well as newspapers from Italian colonies in Africa, um, such as the Giornale di Addis Abeba. This poster confirms a complicated network of parts within the whole of Italy, a single nation with one official language that then breaks down into individual regions. Here, ideas about mass culture, history, and empire coalesce as the image articulates the various steps in then modern journalism, stenography, linotype, radio transmission sent from the front, a local newsman calling out events, a cronista, and of course the editorial process, Bozza Coretta, and the Striloni who would yell out news headlines in the streets such as the one found on the front page of Mussolini's own newspaper on November 15th, 1914 with the headline, Guerra. An earlier poster called La Carta e Ora, E oro, sorry, <laughs> paper is gold. Supplement number four uses a scientific-like flowchart to illustrate the process of paper manufacture from start to finish, following the goods to their final destination, books and notebooks for children. The pink, blue, yellow, and gold colors outline what amounts to be what is a sort of proto-computer-like anatomy for the paper industry. In any discussion connected to fascist urbanism, the central importance of mural surfaces, as I said earlier, cannot be overstated. The last two decades have witnessed excellent analyses of permanent and temporary public works by Mario Cironi, Gino Severini, Enrico Prampolini, and others, who wrapped the exterior and interior surfaces of fascist buildings throughout the regime with powerful propagandistic images. In 1933, at the Triennale, the year in which the Ente program was launched. Moreover, artists like Cironi, Campiglia, and others penned a quote-unquote manifesto of mural painting, asserting its central importance in the political and aesthetic discourse of the day. Diane Gerardo has shown the unrealized plans for the photomontage on the facade of the Casa del Fascio that I started out with in my talk, even though that was never realized. Or, as Romy Golan has pointed out, the fascist celebration of even portable mural projects projected for public spaces and administrative buildings were exhibited in the Prima Mostra di Plastica Murale per l'edilizia fascista, which was held in the Palazzo Ducale in Genova in 1934. Not to mention the programs executed that iconographically celebrated technology, as in Benedetta Marinetti's series of murals for the post office in Palermo, or even um, there. Um, Enrico Prampolini's mosaics of telecommunications and aerial communication for the post office at La Spezia. My point here is that we should think more carefully not only about mural activities in the form of official commissions, but also in terms of ephemeral posters, reflective surface materials that captured fleeting um, images, and even graffiti that transformed the interior and exterior walls of buildings into what I would call cinematic skins that added dynamism and diversity to daily life. In offering some, my sort of closing thoughts on radio's place in the fascist imagination, I turn back to Siegfried, Siegfried Krakauer's seminal essay of 1927 on the mass ornament. 
And he writes, the bearer of the ornaments is the mass and not the people. For whenever the people form figures, the latter do not hover in midair, but arise out of a community. A current of organic life surges from these communal groups which share a common destiny with their ornaments, endowing these ornaments with a magic force and burdening them with meaning to such an extent that they cannot be reduced to a pure assemblage of lines. Thus, whether children gathered around a radio, a de facto miniature crowd, was reminiscent of the larger masses reflected back to them in the posters, which again and again shows not only crowds assembled for political rallies, ancient and contemporary, but also the exhibitions that commemorated those events. And so radio, like the buildings themselves, themselves becomes an ornament decorated with the people. Do I have two more minutes? Yeah, OK. Listening to radio, whether at school or in the streets, confirmed for the individual membership, it confirmed individual membership in a larger collective. Images such as these posters published by the Ente Radio Rurale show that fascist visions of urbanism from the air featuring bird's eye views of Volo Ducello did not change only as a result of the invention of the airplane and its artistic progeny, Ero Pittura. Rather, Italy's other entry into the, into the air through radio instantly transformed the virtual into the real, thus closing the seemingly insurmountable gap between center and periphery. The supplemental posters issued by the Ente in conjunction with La Radio Rurale, the magazine, are evidence of yet another layer of the regime's propagandistic employment of mural surfaces. These graphic windows provided a space of cultural reflection, and by cultural reflection, I refer to a political reflection of a fascist self as consolidated within a collective. Moreover, the masses themselves were projected back within those segments of these images containing crowds in uniquely self-reflexive aesthetic gestures that allowed for instant historicization. Conceived at a moment of growing political import not only for radio but also for the arts of cinema and photography as unifying media in the inscription of the masses into the spiritual rebirth of a nation, the images served as windows of propaganda onto a fascist imaginary rather different from the typically bleak experience of peasants stationed in the Agropontino and elsewhere in the periphery, disconnected from things happening in Rome, Milan, and Torino, and other cities. As such, they functioned as false mirrors, fantasies, if you will, aimed at not only illustrating the words emitted by the radio sets, but also at constructing Italian identity through a set of adopted histories, events, and places in, in sync with the regime's ambitions for a new Italy. Thank you. Does anyone have questions? And you can answer in Spanish, and I can do my best. I'll probably answer in English, but I'm happy to take them. And I have more posters if you want to see more of them. Anyone? Los colores. Los colores? Sí. Sí, sí, sí. L'artista es un problema. Es un problema en el senso que, can I answer in English? So Jeffrey Schnapp has referred to these posters as being designed by Oreste Gasparini, which may be the case, but he's definitely someone who his profession was much more as a journalist reporting. And so the question is, who was really the designer? And there were four different publishers, none of whom have archives or exist anymore. There are no recordings. Um, that one can go back to to find out anything like that either. So who the artist was is, is complicated. And I, you know, I've spent on two separate occasions a month doing research, and I've ended up not finding out. I need to go for a whole year, I think. But it's, there, it's for sure, I agree with you, there's a similarity in the kind of syntax, the visual syntax of using black and white images against a colored background. Um, I don't think that they're all by the same artist. I mean, I think a lot of them have this look, but I think that that's really different. I mean, my, you know, I mean, artists change, but I think this is a very different kind of aesthetic. Um, the other thing I will say that I took out of the talk is that the numerical system is completely off. And so what you'll see is, you know, the posters are linked to dates, which one would assume was it 
when a program was transmitted, and then they were reused repeatedly. But you'll have poster number 12, and then poster number three, and then poster number seven. And I've, and I've talked to a number of people who are obsessed with fascist radio. There's a wry journalist who this is his project. I spent endless hours. He's never figured it out. There's a private um, foundation in the north of Italy where they collect primarily the actual radios, but they have a number of the posters, and they've published a number of the posters, but they, they're not art historians. They haven't analyzed them in any way. And we also had a long conversation this summer about what is the number. And my, my suspicion is that the program was made, and the posters were made in a certain order, and then that did not end up being the order in which the programs were broadcast. But it's very, it's very confusing, and I, I have to say I've driven myself totally crazy with thinking that maybe it's the number of the year of the fascist regime. Maybe it's the number of the month of, if you're counting from, you know, October. But it doesn't, it doesn't map out with any, I, I haven't had any rational success with that. But um, what I have started to work on are some of, I've finally tracked down some of the heirs, the grandchildren of some of the radio announcers. And that's been really interesting because I've started to access some of the archives that they have that is their material for the programs they put together for kids. Um, I only talked about the one magazine today that also has similar kind of style design to the posters, but there were other magazines for children connected to other programs. These are the ones that I found the most interesting when I found them. At, uh, some of them, not all of them. No one has a complete set, supposedly. Um, I found a few of them at the Wolfsonian in Florida, in Miami, which is a wonderful resource if you're interested in fascist material and interwar propaganda and decoration. Any other questions? I'm happy to answer them. I should ask something that I'm still trying to figure out. Uh, could you? You mentioned you have extra posters. Yeah, yeah, I have a couple more, I think. Let's see. You want to see more? Yeah, definitely. Okay. This one from the Aldo Aldige, where you have that um, 1928 monument in Bolzano to World War I. Um, let's see. What else did I not show you? This one I think I showed you, L'Impero Fascista. I think we. I think I showed you this one already. Pero, ¿usted cree que 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 estos montajes eran obra de 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 artistas formados o o eran? Si entendí bien, dijo usted que eran quizás cosas que hacían los propios periodistas. Do you think they were done by uh, educated artists, or rather by uh, journalists or the speakers themselves? or My I, I, suspicion, from what I know a little bit about the first, like the Palazzo della Radio, I think they were done in-house, is my sense, that they were done by staff members that were kind of throwing together the programs themselves. I don't think that they were commissioned, because I think there would be more documentation if they were... So I think they were seen, I, I don't know that there was that much attention being given to a lot of the really interesting graphic designers doing other kinds of advertisements, for example, which are loaded with racist content, let's say, for companies like Perugina in the 30s. I mean, at some point I did a project where I read every single Sunday supplement <laughs> to the newspaper, <laughs> and the advertising was really, really interesting but I never found the name of an artist associated with it. See? 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 Mm 
Uh -huh, uh -huh. Pero yo me atrevería a decir que muchos de estos, en Europa para que da las órdenes de lo que quiere ver, y eso es lo que limita de repente o nos hace creer que tal vez no son artistas los que hablan de este tipo de producción. Yo, yo creo que sí. Uh -huh. That, that they have formal academic training. I, I don't necessarily doubt that, but my question is, or my suspicion is that, and it's very difficult because when the Nazis occupied Rome and they took over the, the Palazzo de la Radio, they totally destroyed a lot of the decoration in there. And the photos are really, really limited and hard to find. There's a, there's a couple, I mean, I showed you limited ones, but some of the designs, even for things that survive in photos, are similar. So, but honestly, I have not been able to, you know, I would love to find a folder in the archives that said <laughs> some, I mean, I would love. <laughs> I tried all summer, it was 43 degrees Celsius, <laughs> I schlepped around Rome, but I haven't so far found them, you know. And it's hard because the publishing houses who printed the posters don't exist anymore. That's one of the problems. But I have a few, a few more places to look. I'm not totally hopeless, but I'm frustrated. <laughs> However, um, photo montage was highly appreciated by avant-garde artists, but uh, I, I, I mean, we have uh, mysterious uh, um, designers like yours here uh, who will, I mean, we will probably never be able to, to understand who they were, but this looks like it was uh, not the kind of work that an artist uh, was um, pretty sure he, could, he should be responsible for, uh, to take responsibility for. I mean, that, that's, that's the sense we have, because we have very high quality uh, newspaper and uh, uh, magazine uh, mm -hmm. work that really we don't know anything about the, yeah, the I mean, I, the, when I first was looking at these, it was the same time I was looking through an, a, a really enormous quantity of ephemera, advertisements for travel and goods and things given out at world's fairs and art fairs. And there's, there's a consistency stylistically, but not so much that I could say, oh, the same man or woman who did these posters did this program. It's very frustrating because in some ways, I think so many more people were affected by images like this than they were by a specific mosaic somewhere um, or a specific portrait painting of Mussolini or something like that. Like this was everyday life for a lot of people. And so I think they're significant and important, but knowing more about the artist would be helpful. I mean, I, there are certain assumptions I could make, which are that in order to be working on these, you would have had to have been a card-carrying fascist to have a job. Yeah. So does that mean that these were enthusiastic fascists? Not necessarily, I don't know. It doesn't excuse them, but you know, I, I, I don't know. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course about the, the magazine or the journal, if I uh -huh, understood uh -huh. well. There's because, a, it's a magazine. Yeah. If I understood well, there are like three um, elements here. On the one hand, the poster. Mm -hmm. On the other, the radio mm -hmm. uh, program. Mm -hmm. And then the magazine, I mean, three elements in which the communication with people works out. Are all those, the three things, the radio program, the poster, and the magazine, are uh, children-orientated or adults? These three. These three. There are many, many other programs that were for adults. There, are, There's a second magazine that was for children. Um, there's other specific programs I could talk about. Nono Radio. There's this, you know, Grandpa Radio project. Um, but these three are very specifically linked. And the magazine is, is, is a real thing you can look at. It's seven years of a magazine that, you know, I, look, I read every single page. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, a combination of being kind of a calendar of what's happening and then also a kind of elaboration on, you know, the, pro the program might be one hour, but the magazine, and the magazine got longer and longer, I would say. 
And the magazine also documented historical events. You know, Mussolini goes to dedicate the new Casa del Fascio in blah, 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 blah. So that a lot of the information seems to be much more extensive than what's in the posters. What I can't tell you, because I have found a very, very, very limited number of transcripts. There are no recordings, or at least that's what everybody tells me, and I go, I call, I wait, I ask, and they say, no, senora, non c'è nulla. But <laughs> who knows? They also told me there was no magazine, but I found the magazine finally. So what was the name again, sorry, of the magazine, the name? La Radio Rurale. And, and the magazine is really a beautiful kind of artifact in and of itself. And it would be a wonderful thing if, for example, they would scan all of it and put it online. Because it's there that you see a lot of, well, and it's literally crumbling. Like the first time I looked at it three years ago and last summer when I looked at it, it's, it's harder and harder to read because it's literally disintegrating. It's on terrible paper. It's not on gold paper. <laughs> it's on terrible paper. But the magazine also, you know, it's sort of like a news bulletin. It's very much, it has a lot of news connected to education. Like, you know, three new schools were built in blah, blah, blah place. Um, it mentions cultural events. It mentions new buildings, the restoration of old buildings. It mentions, but then there's lots of things about Christopher Columbus or Michelangelo or Leonardo. Um, and then there's these entertaining things, you know, like the drawing competition. And so it sort of gives, it reminds me very much of a magazine in the States that I used to see when I was a child called Highlights for Kids. And there would be, you know, word scramble games and drawing ideas, um, but mixed with cultural events. And then, of course, heavy, very heavy-handed propaganda about the regime. You know, Mussolini is kissing children and babies like in every other picture. It's awful. So it's a mix. It's a mix of things. Yeah. ¿De, de dónde vienen las imágenes en sí, las fotos? Porque dices que unas se repiten, pero tampoco. I don't know. A lo mejor. I mean, some of them, some of them are, you know, photographs of famous documents. Some of them are photographs of what seem to be famous documents that are probably invented for the purpose. Um, that I don't know. In some cases, there are famous paintings included that end up because they're photographs of paintings in black and white. You don't realize till you look more closely that they're famous um, paintings. Um, but I can't give you a list of the source images. It's like a kind of unsolved puzzle. And as I said, some people who have mentioned them, really, they people like putting them in exhibitions because they look nice, right? You have a radio sitting there. How interesting at a certain point is a box for people who aren't sound engineers who understand that. And then they have these nice posters. But some people, I think, frankly, are very dishonest, and they sort of claim to know that they were all designed by Oreste Gasparini. Maybe. You know, some of them have his name, but I think that the name may be there because he authored the programs. So I, I think that there's a lot of, there, there's a lack of clarity. I, I failed to remember the title of uh, the Italian children's, children's encyclopedia, which is looks very much like that, uh -huh. like like exemplary characters and scenes of battles, and it is like I, I don't remember, I don't remember the title. Okay, but I, I will. I'll look for that. That's a uh, good there, comparison. I mean, one thing I have to say I haven't done a lot of is I haven't looked. I've looked a little bit, but not enough at sort of the kinds of books that women going to school to become teachers, you know, who were studying pedagogy, were looking at. And I think that that's another kind of interesting piece of it. That's what I was about to say. You should go into a Mexican um, stationery store for um, teachers. Uh -huh. There's something very much like that. Today? Uh, yeah. Las monografías. Uh -huh. Yeah. We'll go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, muchas gracias. <laughs>